we are sharing. Good. Looks perfect. Uh, oh, good. Um, so that's a very nice introduction. Thanks, Phil. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, we're here today on this the very first time we're actually running this workshop. And my name is Joanna. It will be the one that you'll be hearing the most. Uh, but we also have uh, facilitating the workshop, Lucas and Mark, and they'll be more in the um, bit in the backstage handling your questions. Uh, I want to do just a tiny bit of housekeeping in addition to what Phil already said. Let me start the slideshow. There we go. So besides checking if you have access then to the Posit Cloud, um, and besides checking that you have the Slido link and access to the Zoom chat, we also um, would recommend to have some pen and paper or the digital version of it. Um, it's it's good to have some place to take notes. We plan on making this workshop a bit a bit of a thinking type of workshop, so this might be helpful. Um, we we also know this is a two hour. Well, you should know this is a two hour workshop, not too long, but either way have some water, coffee or tea, whatever you need at the ready. So to start, I would say, let's move over to Slido first, because we think the best way to start is actually to get to know you a little bit. Um, in fact, getting to know what you know about analysis results data and about the analysis results data model. So if you go over to Slido, I'm gonna start now a series of polls. I'm going to, um, uh, Joan, I'm going to add everybody real quick or just provide oh, the okay. uh, user link. Yeah. Just give me two seconds sure. to do that here. Um, yeah, on top of that, sorry about that, forgot, really forgot about this. On the top right of the slide that you're seeing right now, you have the QR uh, image there. If you want to join via smartphone on Slido, ah. you can scan that. If Perfect. not, you can go to slido.com, put that number there, or you will buy the link that uh, is going to be posted in the Zoom, Zoom chat. Yep, so. just provided it. That's a bit <clears throat> mishap, but yeah. Plenty of ways of joining Slido. Okay, so I'll give you a few minutes to join in. You know, can see that some people are already responding. It's very good. Say so I'm gonna start checking some of the results that we are having. And I think you should all also be able to see some of the results that we're getting as soon as you finish the poll. You should be able to see it also in real time. I have around 20 people that have responded so far. And right now, no is winning. So not that many people know about okay. No, never mind. It's 50-50 now. Like a perfect split. Okay, so a few more seconds because there's still quite a few people responding. Okay, it seems like the no is picking up sleep speed. So not that many people, well, the majority of people here are not too familiar about analysis results data. Not a problem because we will go over it, obviously. Um, experience with the with analysis results data or analysis results data sets, we see that not that many people have experience. They're actually hoping on getting started today. So that's good to know. And also quite a few people that heard about this before, but didn't really use them. And some that use them privately, that's also good. Now about the analysis results data model, we have also vast majority of people do not know what this is. Not surprising, it's even more of a well, it's more niche than anything else, to be fair. And then if we go to what do you hope to learn from the workshop? Okay. Whether the analysis results data model could be applied to pharmacometrics. Okay, basic concepts, getting familiar with it, basic understanding, how to improve my statistical modeling workflow. Not sure. Well, at least we're getting to know a bit about it. So, and how others are using analysis results data. Okay, that's good. I'm gonna 
stop then this poll now. So it seems like um, there's quite a few people that don't know what analysis results data is. Even less people know what analysis results data model are, but people seem to be interested and curious. And there uh, seems to be quite a bit of enthusiasm. Thank you for responding to the poll. We will be running a few of these throughout today. And it's really, really nice to see that you're participating. OK, so why are we even running this workshop? So first of all, we got an invitation from the RN Pharma Committee, and we are very thankful for that. So when we got that invite, it immediately kind of sparked a bit of it showed us that this could be a way for us to increase the visibility for the topic of analysis results data um, and also for the analysis results data model. So this is something that we worked on starting a couple of years ago and um, specifically for the analysis results data model, we think that the way to have this idea evolve is to actually hear from the community that would be using it. So that's a key reason also for running this workshop. We are very, very interested in hearing what you have to say about uh, the ideas that we're putting forward here. And we want to use that ideas, those ideas to shape how the ARDM should be. I also want to make a bit of a disclaimer here. Some of you that said that know what analysis results data is and even what the analysis results data model is. Um, I think some might might be because uh, you're aware of what CDISC is doing in this area with the analysis results standard. Um, the disclaimer here is that this, is, this workshop should be viewed as something separate from CDISC. We are not proposing a standard. We are not telling uh, you that this is what we think is a good solution or what you think is a solution. We are more interested in viewing um, this for more of a consumer level, thinking about what is useful for us, testing our ideas, seeing them fail even, and going back to the initial stage, to the drawing board and change everything. So there's really no barriers. Um, it's more about building consensus and see how to move forward. Um, that's, that's the key. So now for the learning outcomes that we have prepared for this workshop, it's uh, it's matching quite a lot of, of what you answered in the survey. So we really hope that by the end of the workshop, those who don't know what analysis results data and analysis results data model are, or I hope that you then know a bit more about us. Um, and we hope as well that you can appreciate a bit the problems that the ARDM tries to address and see if that actually fits uh, some of the, or benefits some of the areas that you work on. And finally, one of the last uh, outcome learning outcomes is to understand how do you actually start building your, your own um, ARDM. So for the agenda today, just for you to have an overview of what we're going to talk about, um, the first hour, more or less, it's going to be more of an introduction to the topic. Um, and then we'll have a small break. And this is then the second part is going to be focused more on the exercises. Um, in, in between, we have, um, or especially after each exercise, you're going to have a questions, um, open questions, basically. So we'll go over to Slido and select a few. And, before the break, and maybe a few times in, in between the different areas of the first part, you can also have some questions, uh, question and answer sessions. Okay, so for to make sure that everybody's on the same page, um, I'll do a brief introduction of what is analysis results data and what is the analysis results data model. And then we'll go into more detail about the data model uh, in a few minutes. So. About analysis results data. Now, I want you to think that every single time that you are um, running an analysis, you're actually producing uh, data, but this takes the shape of results. Now, normally, when we think of, um, of results, we tend to associate it more with how we present the results. So something like you have here on the left 
uh, sorry, on the right side, on the data pro product on this plot. This is what we associate with results things, or in this case, products that we create to show the results to others. Plots, tables, for example. We normally don't think about the data sets, for example, the actual data that we have um, when we run the analysis. And this could be, for example, a similar data set as you see here on the left side. Um, so like a data set. Um, so if you start looking at analysis results as data, meaning as these data sets, rather than these products, these plots, there's a few um, questions that start coming up. So one, one thing is that you, you might have to, or, or once you start formalizing the way that you view analysis results uh, as this, this data, there's a, there's a few things that, come, that have start coming up. And one is you might have results appearing in many different ways, even though you're performing the same analysis. This could be because uh, you're using um, different function, could be that you're using um, also um, different libraries or different packages and different functions within those uh, packages. It could be because you're using a completely different programming language. So the structure of your result is gonna change. So you might have something that, uh, data sets that are resultant from your analysis that are, that are resulting from your analysis that might have different column names that, uh, the structure itself of the data set changes might be in a more long format. So that brings the question of, why wouldn't you bring some, um, let's say harmonization to this? Why, wouldn't, why don't we have um, a way of making sure that if we want an analysis, the results would always appear in a certain way? Because if we have that, if you have, let's say a standard around this, uh, we can then reuse the results because we know that they're going to be an expected form. They're always going to be an, an, expect, an expected um, coherent um, structure that we can then exchange with others and that we can also build um, tools that work on top of that structure. So this is more or less what we mean when we talk about analysis results data and analysis results data sets. Um, and to think when you think about the analysis results uh, data model, think about it as a extension to, to the analysis results data. Um, it's an extension and it goes a step, so it goes a step further. This is because if you think about these, these data sets that I showed you before, so these ones here, you might think that, um, well, they, they all come from, from the same analysis because I told you that they all came from the same analysis, um, but you don't know exactly the details behind that analysis. So you know they are different, but they don't know why, you don't know why they are different. So what's missing here is contextual information information that allows you to fully understand how those results were created so that you can even be able to reproduce those results if needed. So that's what the analysis results data model touches on and in capturing this uh, contextual information. And you can, can capture this by looking at everything that stems from the analysis. So when you do an analysis, you have the results, like we said, but you also have information about the analysis itself. So you have, like we mentioned, the programming language that you run the analysis on. Uh, you have um, the um, libraries, for example, that you used functions, the parameters that you specified in those functions. You also have, um, you also uh, can record information about the data that was input if you actually applied it to only apply that analysis to only a section of that data or for all the data if there was any filtering process done, for example. So 
the data model plans out. The idea of it is to capture all of this information, define how to structure it, to define how we actually keep it, the structure of the data sets, let's say, and standardizes how all the information links to one another. Um, but we'll go a bit more into detail uh, with a few more uh, figures that make it easier to understand. So this is the overall idea to have uh, about analysis results data and the analysis results data model. Now, this all seems very complicated. So one question that you might have is, why should you care? Why, why should you care about something that's so complicated? Um, we'll go into a few more reasons a bit later. Um, but first, I want to talk to you about talk to you about a situation that happened not that long ago. Um, uh, actually, at a recent uh, stats conference, and these were basically a group of people. They were presenting the work that they did on um, simulated um, simulated realistic uh, survival data or simulating realistic survival data, and for that they would. They needed, uh, as part of their study, they needed to have benchmark survival data. So they went into the scientific, the repositories for scientific uh, literature, and they found um, scientific papers that were uh, that reported on uh, analysis, survival analysis that were done, and. All of the results that they found, or the majority of the results that they found, were actually presented as Kaplan-Meier plots. So they didn't have the actual data, they only have the figures. So what they had to do to be able to get enough information for their benchmarks was what you're going to see here in this video. Um, this is not a video of them. This is a video uh, of a, uh, that mimics a process that they had to do. So for each plot of each scientific paper, and these were like dozens of them, they had to take a screenshot, go to an external software. They had to then map the axis. They had um, then to map on top of it every single dot that they that was part of the of each survival curve that was showing up. And the only reason they had to do this is because they again the results were stored and were presented just just as these plots. There was no additional information about the actual data that was used to produce these this product, these plots. And the reason why this happens is because it's it's in our mindset. It's in our mindset to think that the result of an analysis is going to be some kind of product. It's going to be plot a table. It's going to be a presentation that we do to somebody. It's going to be a report. And it's not. It's actually the data. So can move forward now. So Myself, Lucas, and Mark met uh, when I was doing a short-term program at Novartis. And one thing we all shared was that we thought we viewed analysis results as actual data. And we saw that doing this was already, doing this was, was first of all, allowing us to have results that were machine readable. And by default, this was already lifting a lot of barriers because we could then start reusing results instead of repeating analysis. And we could continue the knowledge discovery process because of this ability to reuse the results, right? Think about meta-analysis, for example, if you could easily then perform that because you have actual data rather than going through, um, again, for example, a bunch of literature to find the results that you need and to extract them in a way that you can uh, actually read them in your programs, it was much easier to have them as data, not as these products. 
So because there was a lot of ideas around this topic, uh, we decided that the best way to kind of wrap everything was to write a paper. And this is when we also started thinking a little bit more about um, this context that surrounds results and that we should keep this information as well to make sure that we can reproduce the results. Um, so we wrote a paper and um, you might see that there's another author in that paper, Simon. He's not uh, here today, but he was a very important part of the, yeah, the thinking process that uh, led for us to think about the ARDM. Um, this workshop is gonna just touch just the surface of what we have on the paper. So I, if you find it interesting or if you have uh, additional questions or if you want to dig a little bit deeper, I think this is a very good place to start um, to have a look at the paper in, in depth. Um, as part of this paper, we also have a repository um, with a code repository that has, um, um, let's say, a suggestion for an analysis results data model or the, the, first, the first concept that we had. Um, that's that is um, more detailed than what we're going to do today. So again, I really suggest you to have a look at this uh, afterwards. Okay, so we can now go a bit into more detail for the reasons why we would need an analysis results data model. So we already mentioned that every single time you're doing an analysis, you are producing data and the shape of results. Now we don't really think about it like that. Like I said, we think about how we present the results to others, plots, tables are very common ways. Um, but we also saw that if you focus on uh, viewing results as these products, it becomes very, very difficult, um, if not impossible to reuse them. And this wouldn't be a problem if we did not reuse them, but we do. Even in clinical development, you might be, you might have a result of the analysis, uh, or you, you might have your analysis results, and then from there you produce uh, a plot and you put that in the CSR, and then you want to have a different version of that plot. You want to reformat it a bit. You want to add some colors, uh, and you want to add that plot to an internal presentation that you're going to give to another group. But we normally don't have the data itself. We would have to redo the analysis and then do the plot again. So if we have these, these data products, these plots, instead of having the actual data, if you want to reproduce something, you're, or you're left, or if you want to reuse uh, results, you're kind of left with three options. You, you saw the, the video that was one of them. So if you only have access to the, to the actual product, let's, let's, let's say a plot, it's the easiest uh, way of thinking about this. Let's say you only have access to the plot, which is what that group of people only had access to. They could only have access to a Kaplan-Meier and did not have any information about uh, the results themselves. You had to reverse engineer the plot, like they did with that software, to be able to extract each data point. The second option would be you might have access to some document that is detailing um, the analysis that was performed. So you might try to just reproduce that analysis, rewrite that analysis, and see if you get the same results. Um, see if you can produce the same plot to verify if you have the same results. But what, what, what tends to happen here, uh, and a lot of people don't fully understand it initially, is that when we, even when we document an analysis, there is a lot of um, small decisions that are made that tend to not be recorded. So these could be decisions that are made, for example, 
because of someone's expertise. You might be an expert in a certain area, you might perform that analysis and you make some decisions and you don't necessarily log them in detail. You don't write them in a plan in detail because you think that well, should be things that, because you forgot or because you think that it's not too relevant to write because it should be obvious, for example. Um, you might have the case um, where um, it's just because of the data, you realize that there are some changes that have to be done in the analysis and you adapt it, but you don't fully record that in a plan. So that means that you don't have the complete picture needed to fully redo the analysis and get the same results. Right, and all of this is assuming that you have access as well to the data that was used to, to where the analysis was performed. Then you have the third option, which would be that you actually have a script that contains all the steps of the analysis. Um, you have access to the data that was uh, that was analyzed. So you think you're you're able to fully reproduce what you're doing, but then of course, if you don't have information about package versioning and the environment that was used you're gonna have a lot of problems to try and reproduce that. And of course, we're all making, we're con continuously making um, improvements in all of these areas, but this is something that um, still happens a lot. Okay. So there's a lot of conditions that, that we have to meet. Um, so what we think is that, again, we have to pivot our mindset reframe the target of the analysis to actually be a data source that you can reuse and uh, that you can easily access as well. And if you start thinking about results then as data, it, it opens um, it opens the door to a lot of ideas that come from other areas like data management and data stewardship. And um, for example, one of the key concepts of data management is to actually have data models that structure how the information um, is um, stored, let's say, and what information is actually kept and how does that, do that pieces of information relate to one another. Okay, so um, I don't know if there is a lot of questions or if I should continue and then we stop before the Break. I think. I think uh, most have just been comments about the video and paper. Uh, so I think if you want to keep going. Okay, fine. Okay, then I'll go into the ARDM in more detail then. So this figure that you're seeing here is uh, one figure that comes from the paper actually. Um, and when, when, we talk about an analysis results data model. Um, we actually are referring to to this, and you could see very easily that it's not just the data model. It has three pillars. Um, so it has this standard input, and this basically means that when you're performing an analysis, analysis the assumption that the assumption is that you're using. Um, data that, uh, or source data that uh, follows a, an expected structure. And this is something, is something that we already have with the CDISC standards like Adam and STDM. Then the second pillar here is the analysis standard. And this is a bit more complex. And I would say this is something that it's not, um, Still, still a bit not as polished as the, as, as the rest of our ideas. Uh, and the, but, but the idea behind it overall is that you should be able, an analysis standard is a way of abstracting an analysis into a collection of steps. So think about when you're doing an analysis, there's first step, which can be loading the data then you have, um, for example, selecting certain variables. Then you might fit a model. 
and then you might do some tidying at the end. So the analysis standards would be then a collection of these steps of loading, selecting, um, fitting, tidying. And then the last part is the, the data model. And this is, again, what the workshop is also going to be focusing on. And this is, uh, like I mentioned before, is this um, way of really formalizing which information we keep um, relating to, to an analysis and how to structure that and how to link all that information with, with one another. Uh, okay, good. So before moving to the next slide, I want you, th this tends to help people when they're thinking about um, how the data model works. So normally, let's just use it as an example, that you have a database and that database is going to be used to store um, your results of your analysis. And you want to make that uh, as um, fitting to your needs as possible. So you want to make sure that the way you're storing your results is not allow not only allowing you to reuse them, but to also reproduce them if needed. So you're going to build a data model. You're going to specify what information you're keeping about the analysis, how to structure it, and how to connect that information. So think about that your database is going to have four tables. Those four tables were defined by the data model as being a table for the study information called studies, another table for demographic variables, stores information from demographic variables, a third table for the analysis metadata, so information about the analysis itself, and then um, another table that stores the results. So this analysis results data set, let's say, specifically for descriptive analysis. So you could have a different table as well that would store the results of, the, of another analysis, like a survival analysis. So your data model defines these four tables, and it also defines what information should be kept there. So we see that for the studies, we have a name and uh, in this case, an example of one of the arms for that study. And it has an ID as well, um, a unique identifier. Then for the demographics, you'd have then the name of that variable, if it's uh, the unit, if it's continuous or discrete. And then we, this example here, we have the correspondent, the expected correspondent, correspondent column name in the Adam data set. And again, a unique identifier for that specific demographic variable. Then we have the metadata for the analysis. And you see that there's a little bit more information here collected about the person who run that analysis, one that was run, which software we use, uh, was used, um, which package. And then again, we also have an ID. And finally, on the last table, we have the results, and this is where we started to link all the other three. So each result also has a unique ID, and you see here that you have a link to the analysis uh, metadata, you have a link to the study ID, uh, and to the demographic variable ID, exactly. And then you have the actual results being stored. So when you think about uh, a data model being used, think about something like this, that you have a database that follows exactly what you modeled in the data model. So keep this in mind for um, the exercises that will come later, because uh, this tends to be um, um, this tends to be very helpful for people. Another thing that tends to be helpful um, and it helped us as well when we were writing the paper, which is to think about a few principles. And we specifically, again, in that paper, we wrote these six principles. So this helps you to guide, help, help, helped us guiding, um, helped us in um, 
the having a clear outcome for the ARDM. So the first principle is searchable, meaning the, at the, the end goal is to have um, a consistent way of searching over information, of finding the results that we need, uh, of querying uh, consistently uh, via other, and be able to use other tools such APIs. Again, having a database that follows this, this data model. The second principle is uh, non-redundant, meaning if we have the results stored and information as well about the analysis, it shouldn't be any need to repeat an analysis unnecessarily. If we have the results stored, then we can just reuse them. And this is quite important because if you reuse results and if you know, if you have enough information to understand their context, how they were generated, it means that you have a single source of truth. Um, that means that those results, that analysis that generated those results could also have passed the validation process. And the results that you have shared, that you have um, um, stored are actually, again, already validated in a product that you do with them. Different plots, different tables. They're already coming from validated results. So you don't need to validate things second time, for example. So you have this source of truth. The third thing is a separation of concerns. And you saw that the way the analysis results data model works is by separating every piece of information into their own, let's say, table, just to make it a bit easier. And this means that you can separate the analysis then from the information that you have about the actual data itself and then the results or the study itself and then the results. But it also facilitates adding um, additional information if needed. So let's say that your original data model only has four tables, but then you realize that you have different analyses that uh, produce completely different results that don't fit the tables that you already have. So you have to add a few more, and that's not a problem as long as you can link everything. The fourth principle is rep being reproducible. Uh, again, this goes into keeping enough contextual information about the result itself and, uh, that, and specifically about the analysis that you can actually reproduce uh, the entire workflow. Then interoperable meaning it shouldn't matter, for example, which programming language you're, used, you're using, as long as you're able to, um, you should always be able to kind of format the result into a structure that is defined by the model. Um, so that means that it's easy for you to, to have, again, this, this unique location where you have results that might have come even from different um, from different languages, and they're still you're still you're still able to reuse them. Then the last um, principle is community driven. So you probably realize by now that there is a lot of uh, source of uh, there's a lot of ways that. Um, there's a lot of variations into the way you can create a data model, an analysis results data model. So we really think that to evolve the data model and to shape it into a solution, into a better solution and something that fits um, the community, then we should be taking feedback from the community. We should be able to uh, build it in a way that incorporates the, the different opinions, but at the same time reaches a consensus as well. So the idea here is that this is designed by and for the community. Um, okay, so that's, I'd say it for the first part of the workshop. I think now would be a good time to have some questions before we go for, let's say five minute break. So, 
I don't know if Mark and Lucas, you find a few questions that came up. Yes, Joanna, can you hear me okay? Um, yeah, I can hear you. I think the first question is from um, Karan, and it's maybe just a typo in the slides. It's, the question was from where was analysis meta data ID coming from in the last table? So this is the, the four tables prior to the principles. Yeah, I think you know what you're mentioning. I also realized. So this, this, oh, sorry. <laughs> this should not be one M1. This should be a M1 coming from here. That's, that's well spotted, thank you. And I think Thomas picked that up as well, so thanks, Thomas. Um, and then the second question is from Paolo, is um, you may not want to have everyone have full access to all information. Would you consider accessibility permissions as part of the ARDM model? Uh, yeah, I think that that makes complete sense. Um, there's something as well that we have uh, highlighted a bit on the paper, um, yeah, because this, Having that type of permissions would enable you to share it, for example, with uh, yeah, with different parts of the company. Uh, for example, if you do it internally, that might not have need to have access to uh, certain details, or even have access if you ended up storing as well um, subject level uh, data, then you could keep that uh, from being accessible for certain people. Yeah, that's definitely a good point. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Joanna. Uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead, Mark. And this is again from Karen. Um, you mentioned this model is following guidelines, but it's separate from CDISC. Am I understanding this correct? Also, where do I find the latest guidelines on this? So Lucas and I have um, provided links to the CDISC ARS, but maybe you could comment on the first part around this being separate from CDISC. Um, yeah, sure. So this this is separate from CDISC. Um, so we're not following the same guidelines. We actually started to work on this before the standard from CDESC was published, so there was no guidelines at, the, at that time. Uh, what we have is these principles that kind of, we kept this in the back of our mind when we thought about ARDM, but there are no like solid, um, from our side at least, there's no solid guidelines in the sense of it has to be done in this way and, and this is a recommended way to do this and that. So that we don't have those guidelines. Uh, at least we, we don't have concrete ones. Um, so this is completely separate from, from CDISC. Um, and I think, yeah, exactly. Mark and Lucas already sent, uh, put on, posted on the chat the links for the standard uh, from CDISC. And they, they do give some guidelines into how, in their view, how, they, uh, how this uh, data model should um, yeah, should should take shape basically. Okay. So if there are no more questions, I think I will continue. Uh, let me start sharing the screen again. There we go. Perfect. So let me move forward here. So we have a break and now we move on to the case study. And for our case study, we are going to touch um, on the Kaplan-Meier plot. Um, so every, every exercise is gonna be around this. And we want to make also uh, something clear is that the exercises are gonna be, they're not gonna go into too much detail just because uh, they can get very complex, very fast. So this is more like a starting guide. Um, and uh, they will focus on performing data analysis, having, uh, keeping in mind the idea of analysis results data and uh, creating an analysis results data model in the process, building a simple ARDM. And uh, we will explore uh, the principle or the, the idea of the reusability of results. And we had here, if time permits, the interoperable principle that, that we um, touched on before, but we might not have sufficient time for that. So we'll see how the two first exercises go. So why are we focused on a Kaplan-Meier plot? Um, this might seem um, 
So first of all, the Kaplan Meyer part did have a bit of a rough start, let's say. It was not something that um, uh, was immediately uh, accepted, but nowadays it is very much uh, part of, um, it is a very much, it's a, it's a graphical display that appears um, in many, many uh, types of indications to display survival data. Um, and a lot of people think that the kaplan meyer tends to follow very specific, um, normally takes a specific shape. So there doesn't, there's not much variation to the plot, but that's not actually true. Um, so if you um, start dissecting uh, the Kaplan-Meier, you can see that there are a lot of components that are part of it. So you have, for example, uh, let's see if I can have a, oh, here we go. So you can have um, the, data area where you actually would have then your results. So this is where you have, uh, for example, the survival estimates. Um, then you have here in green um, additional information that also come from your, from your results, but they're displayed, for example, below the plot uh, or annotated here above the plot. You also can have um, additional analysis that you add to the plot like you have here. So in this case, an additional uh, inferential statistics, the uh, hazard ratio. And um, you have as well information on um, details of the plot itself of, um, in terms of labels, titles, uh, and annotations. So there is uh, quite a bit more to it than a lot of people think. Um, so starting the first exercise, I'll start first with the slides and then I'll move on to the um, documents that I have in the cloud. So I will start as well a poll very soon, but I want you to have a look at this very, very simple Kaplan-Meier uh, plot. And I want you to potentially get pen and paper to take some notes. And I want you to think about three questions and they are now appearing on the Slido and the Slido polls also have the same figure. I want you to think about if you want to reproduce that Kaplan-Meier plot um, and assuming you're creating then this analysis results data model, what information do you need to keep to be able to reproduce it? How would you categorize that information? And then how would you actually structure the data model? So these three questions are polls as well in Slido. And um, I want to hear what you think before we move uh, to the actual exercise. So this is part of the exercise, but let's say before we move to the cloud. So I wanted to take a bit of time to think about this. I see that some people are responding. Very good. Thank you for responding. couple of minutes. Joanna, I'll ask if we wait, there's another question from um, Karen that maybe you could pick up just as um, at the end of the period or the responses. Just let me know when you want me to read it. Okay. I think maybe we can go to that question now because I see that a lot of people are responding. 
And this is an open text uh, one, so it might might take a bit longer. If you want to go ahead and ask that question. Um, so the general principle is, so is CDESC willing to adopt these updates in the future? So what's the relationship between the model you're presenting and the CDESC model or the standard? And as we start to adopt this, what should we keep in mind? Should we focus on your model principles or the CDESC standard? And then just um, additional, um, with this working group, are we working with the working group? To, uh, or are they taking their guidelines or are we taking their guidelines? What's the kind of um, relationship between your work and the CDESC working group? Um, so CDESC is aware of what we did. Uh, we actually had some conversations with them. Um, we are not too involved in the guidelines that you're producing now. Um, they are, as far as I know, taking feedback from others. So they, they even recently had a hackathon. Um, so in terms of what guidelines you should keep, I think the a good way of, of, of using this workshop is to have a, um, I would say an introduction to the actual way of constructing this data model and viewing things in a data and as an analysis results data and in, in a data model way, because um, at least I got we got this feedback a few times that with CDISC um, it's a bit tricky to get started in the beginning. Um, there's a lot of there's already a lot of guidelines uh, and it tends to be very difficult to start. So view this as a simplified way of starting, and I would say that's that's the the key thing of taking from here, and then. Given that CDISC is uh, opening, uh, is open to suggestions, even via these hackathons that they do, um, I would say use the feedback, use use that opportunity to provide feedback uh, based on um, what uh, what um, what you experiment on with. I don't know if that answer everything. It was asked. Okay, so we have a bit of, of results coming in from the poll, and I think everybody. I made sure that everybody could see the poll, so as soon as you respond, you should be able to see. And we have quite a few answers now. So key information to keep: we have survival probability through time for both treatments, the legends, the curves, the y x-axis, um, the survival probability is a sense of randomization, the medical and surgical groups. So it seems like everybody is, uh, is, is more or less on the same page. Then we have, how would you categorize these items? And then you have some people saying that by the data product, by the treatment, categorize them through the Grouped time series or by metadata and curves, by groups, stats, columns, drugs. Okay, results data, treatment groups. Okay, so we have we have some variation in how we would categorize this. And then the last question: How would you structure it? Some people are saying provide the complete results for one path provide the difference uh, for calculating this and provide the difference for calculating the second curve and put all raw data, include all the meta, raw metadata and pull the data and process, review the data model analysis data model. Okay. Then we have some people saying long table, use a long format. Okay, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of variation. So what, what uh, so let, let's go, Step by step. So the first question, what is the key information to keep? So having another look at the plot. So when I when I look at this, and again, this is a very opinionative way of viewing things, because you saw that there was much more uh, opinions in the polls. For me, the first thing I see here are the curves, right? So these are the results of a, a survival analysis. They present, the, these are the estimates presented over time, right? They have an X value and a Y value each data point here. Then I see the axis labels. 
which a lot of people also pointed out, and the title and the legend. And then when I start thinking a bit more about this, remember I said we had the estimates presented over time that came from an analysis. So there, there's, um, there's some information already here that's that's that might be that might be need to cap might be needed to to be captured, but we're not fully seeing it. Now, let's move on to the second question: How would you categorize these items? You know, for me again, being very very opinionative suggestion is okay, these estimates presented over time, for me, these are analysis results, again, from a survival analysis. Then I have the output, the, this plot has some, some information about it. So it has some metadata, if you want to call it like that. Um, again, the title, the labels, and the legend. And then remember, we had these results that came from an analysis. So we, in my, in my view, we should also make sure to store the metadata that's associated with this analysis. So the information about how this analysis was done to be able to produce those results. And then comes the third, so the analysis metadata. So there comes the third, uh, it's a bit of a summary of what we had. So now comes the third question finally. How would you actually structure? The data model. And by structure, uh, I mean how would you organize this information? Again, thinking back to this example of these four tables, how would you structure, format these, these tables? And here it, it helps to think about this as to think about the following concept. It's helpful to think about tidy data. Uh, in a sense that data there is easy to manipulate, for example. And then it also helps to think about tidy outputs. And this is something that, uh, for example, the Broom package does. It uh, tidies up different outputs, uh, outputs of different models in a way that is consistent to forming, uh, uh, following a specific structure. And it also helps to think about linked data in the sense that it is machine, we have data that's supposed to be machine readable, special machine readable data that has to be linked to, to each other um, to enable uh, this reproducibility. So going to the actual uh, exercise, let me zoom again. few seconds, so it's resumed. There we go. So if I go then to the first exercise, it will start with the same information that you had, these three questions that we saw in the poll, and then uh, these initial thoughts that you also saw. Now, when we think about the survival analysis results, and this is going to be very specific to R. Um, so we'll just we'll just restrict it to, to, to that. Uh, when you produce a survival analysis, you tend to have quite a lot of information that comes from it, not just um, these estimates that are presented over time. So you might have information immediately about standard errors, confidence interval patients at risk, number of events, censoring, and so on. So on one hand, you to reproduce that plot, you just need to capture a portion of this information, of these results. But on the other hand, we also saw that the Kaplan-Meier can have uh, a lot of variation. So it might, it might um, be that for a different output, a different plot, we might want to have the confidence band showing. So it makes sense to capture as much information as we can. Now, a question that immediately comes up with this is, well, how do I know how much information do I have to capture if I don't know what I'm going to do in the future, which outputs I'm going to produce? Um, and this is where the structure of uh, 
or yeah, the structure uh, enforcement that the data model does comes into play. You have to think a bit about keeping this information in a way, meaning in a structure, in a format that would make it easier to add additional information if needed. So if you if if you end up needing to um, include, if, if initially you didn't store the number of patients at risk and then you wanted to actually store this, you should be able to add this. Um, and that, that means that the way you structure your data model has to be flexible enough. Um, so one way of doing is this would be to have more of a long format of a table. Um, this at least is what we found to be the more um, um, yeah, more flexible. So for example, here, uh, let me just please, quickly. So for example, here, one way would be to have a table that then stores your results from your survival analysis. In this case, I'm just gonna call this, this table, this imaginary table in my database that's gonna follow the data model. It's gonna be called the survival ARD table. And it's going to keep, um, it's going to have an ID. It's going to have a description associated with that ID. I have another column with a strata. And then I have name and value. And the, the idea of having this as name and value is that you might have in each row, name would be the number of events. And then you would have um, the, the value corresponding to that. And then below you might have then the um, the the um, the day, and then you have the value for that. And then you would have then the estimate, and then you have the value for that. And that is a bit more flexible to add information. Then for the outputs metadata, um, so the tables and the uh, sorry, the tables, the labels and the titles. Uh, one could think of, again, repeating the ID and the description. So it should be consistent through all the tables to have a unique way of identifying um, each piece of information that they store, but also a description field that is more readable to humans. So it's uh, easy to quickly understand uh, what it's referring to. And then I decided to put here uh, a field called text and, and another one called type. And this means that, for example, the type would um, keep information regarding if this is a title, if this is a X label or a Y axis label. And text would be the corresponding text to put in the title, to put in the X label and the Y label. Location Joanna, would be if, yes, yeah, sorry. There's just a request if you could increase the font size if possible. Oh, yeah, sure. Sorry about that. This is not visible. I'm really sorry. Okay, is this better? I would Looks think great. It's yeah, better yeah. now. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Okay, so then additional information about location and position. So if this should be in the, for example, for the le for the title, it should be uh, placed in uh, left hand side or the right hand side and um, positioned as well. And then we have the weight, which would be if you want to have uh, certain labels bold or not, and color if you want to color anything, like we have. In the, in the example, you have the legend and each curve has a specific color. And then finally, we mentioned that not only we have to store the results, we also have to store the contextual information about the results. That, that means analysis metadata. Um, and again, this is a very, very rudimentary suggestion. There's a lot of, a lot of other details that should be um, kept about an analysis. Um, but one way of viewing it could be, again, you have an ID and a description. You would keep information about the software that you use, the versions of the software, which libraries, um, 
and for example, the function call that you use to actually uh, execute that uh, or fit that model. And one thing I did here, because we have a very small uh, data model, uh, to not to not make it too large, what I did is remember that the data model should also define how the, all the information is linked. So in this case, I link, I'm linking all the information in the analysis metadata. So I have a field which should um, where you should add the um, ID corresponding to the analysis results that were generated from this analysis, and another ID that should correspond to the output metadata um, that was uh, that that's from um, an output that generated from the well the results of this metadata. So if we would look then into the way of how how all these tables, um, I think I didn't forget to run anything, yeah. So you would have, let's say, a data model that looks a little bit like this. So you have your analysis metadata table, which has then links to the survival uh, ARD, where the survival results are stored, and then an output ID that links to um, this outputs metadata uh, table that stores information regarding the output. So again, this would be the second step would be actually populating this. Um, and in this case, we have already some data prepared in the project. Um, it's following uh, time to event uh, standard. And in this case, we're just using a surf, uh, survival package to fit, uh, calculate the survival estimates, and then we are doing some, again, nothing too complicated. We're just using uh, the apply R functions and we are making sure this information is stored in this these data sets, which are reprodu or basically uh, are this, these tables, taking the shape of these tables that I mentioned at the very beginning, and they are following how we specified um, all the constraints that we were specified in our data model before. So we have the same for the outputs, and then we have lastly, same for the analysis metadata. And in this case, because we only have one analysis stored, um, or one one um, information regarding one analysis stored, we can just immediately query the outputs table, as you see here. And if we we, we use this again very standard way of, of extracting information using the apply R again. We extract information on the uh, title, the labels, the legend, and then we use ggplot to rebuild the plot that we had before. And we are able to reproduce it without rerunning the analysis. We just used the, the, the data sets that we created that are following this data model that we specified at the very beginning. Um, so before I have a couple of questions, um, and I would first ask if there's any questions as well in the chat, and then I will put up some, some polls afterwards. No specific questions in the chat. No specific questions, good. So if there's no specific questions, I will have some some myself to you. So I'll, I open another poll um, with two questions. Let's go back here. And these questions are, um, so thinking about what you said at the very beginning, your answers at the very beginning about what information would you keep? Uh, and given what I just showed you, is there anything that you think that is very, very, very important that, for example, I missed and that you definitely would have saved, uh, would make sure that the model captured that? And also another question would be, compare, uh, in comparison to what, what I, we have in the exercise, would you use a different structure to store the data? And uh, maybe you want to share why you would use that different structure 
or what, what are the key things or the key reasons why why uh, why you would choose something completely different? So I see that some people are entering. That's very good. We have a couple of minutes. So again, if there's any other key information that you think that no, this this should should have been definitely kept, the model should be uh, ensuring that this information is stored. And um, if you would choose a, a different structure uh, for the data, for the data. Okay, we see that some people have responded. Um, so one 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 uh, answer is, for example, the reference to the paper where the plot is coming from, and information about the analysis or which algorithm settings were used for the analysis. Okay, so basically go into more detail about the analysis metadata makes sense. What questions were asked during the analysis and what are what were the decisions? This is a very good one. So this basically means that you're storing not only metadata about how the analysis was performed, but also um, information about discussions that happened around the analysis. So that's I actually never thought about this. But this is this is very, 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 very good point, actually. Some other people are saying data source, so the source of the data. Yes, that makes sense. Um, because if you think about when you perform an analysis, it might be that it also it's very much associated with the data that you're using, so, right, right? Which data you're analyzing, and you can think about, for example, how we do analysis now nowadays when we have um, different data cutoffs. So it might be that an analysis is associated associated with a data database, let's say data cut off day, and the data itself is going to be updated on a different time. And then the analysis might be the same with the results then are different, right? Exactly the version of the source data. It's one of the answers in the poll. Now let's move then to the second part. Would you use a different structure um, to store the data? Um, some people are saying a long form or a nest object seems like a good approach. Yes. Um, a linked graph database. Um, that's so technically, well, the idea of the data model is that um, it could, you could choose how, where you apply it. Um, it could be that you apply it for a database that is a relational, but you could also apply it to a, a graph database as well. Um, but that, that makes sense. Okay. So we had a few answers, so that's very good. Um, okay. So I think this means we completed exercise one. Is there any questions on the Joanna, chat? Joanna, there's a couple of questions yeah. in the chat. Um, the first one's from Jeremy. Um, if one plot needed to create at least three tables, results, output analysis, what do we do if we have many plots, say four plots? It seems hard to manage so many outputs. For example, have four plots and 12 tables. So, okay, so if one plot needs to create at least three tables, so you mean that you're creating basically multiple outputs from the same results? Sorry, I'm trying to fully understand, but I'm going to assume that, yeah, okay, yes, good. Um, yeah, so it, it it does seem that there's a lot of outputs that are being created and, and, they, and that's the reality. If you think about how how you perform this nowadays, um, how you perform the analysis nowadays, you are actually producing a lot of outputs. 
most of the times you don't really realize because um, it just, let's say standard practice. You could put, let's say a, a, a threshold audit. You could say, if I am just in the exploration phase, I might not keep all of this information stored in the database that follows this data model that I specify. But you could also say, I'm just going to keep every information stored. And you can automatize that process. So imagine that you just have your, you just do your analysis and you produce different plots. And again, assuming that everything follows this data model, um, you um, should be able to have a set of standardized function that would help you then approximate your results to what needs to be stored in, um, in your database that follows the, the data model. Um, so yeah, it's a bit of a tricky thing because you could see this growing exponentially. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, but I think we can go to a different question. I think that there's more. Okay, I see that. There's so if I ask, from... I can go ahead and, and check. Yeah. Yeah. I can see here the question from uh, Karen again. So the fields that you're using to capture different information are something we can look up in the guidelines and can use them to capture similar info for other applications. Also, at what point in the analysis suggests starting this process? Uh, as analysis needs can change and seems that there will be a lot of rework. And as this step is not actual product, we might not have enough time to spread out this activity. Um, so in terms of the fields that I'm using, and if you can, if you can look up any guidelines, um, um, I wouldn't say, again, for, for anything, of what I'm showing here. This is a simplification of what we have in the paper. So if you have, if you want to know a bit more of what we suggest, I would say, have a look at the, the paper because um, that links to a repository and you have the creation of these type of tables there. And they go into a bit more detail. We actually uh, made sure that that data, that data model worked for, uh, I think we're producing uh, a demographics table and also I think Kaplan, the Kaplan Meyer. So should fit for demographic analysis and a uh, survival analysis. Uh, but again, these are not solid, uh, or let's say um, hard deadlines, uh, guidelines. These are, are more suggestions. At what point of the analysis you suggest starting this process? Um, again, that goes a bit to the question that Jeremy um, asked in terms of do you keep do you record everything? Um, that's that's a bit, uh, I would say, it's a point where it's a bit up to discussion. On one hand, you would have some groups of people who would say you should record everything you do um, because you never know uh, what, uh, what might be useful to understand what changes happened in that analysis. But we also got a very, very, um, good uh, comment from one of the polls when somebody said that another piece of information to store about the analysis could be the discussions that happen around the analysis. So maybe what we would one suggestion would be wait until you have let's say the let's say the analysis finalized and then associated to that would be uh, a way of recording discussions that happen. And that mutated that analysis until the shape that it's it, the, the last the last shape it, it took. So that would be a suggestion. And then I can see I'm just gonna go through the chat and see the questions. Um, you can see a question from Paolo. There are many flags that are set to the flawed, the default, like this color scheme of the plot. Do you recommend have all parameters explicit? Uh, I would say yes. Uh, this makes it uh, obviously more difficult to model. Um, but I do think that 
in the sense of keeping, of ensuring that the data model has enough information that, that something can be reproducible and keeping in mind that some defaults even might change over time. I would suggest that to keep all parameters uh, and have them explicit. And then you have another question. So maybe as regards to the first question, we could add if the proportionality of hazards is valid or not between the groups. So as not to be able to compare the results uh, from uh, different analysis. Um, yeah, I think I understand your question. And I think yeah, that, that's information that if it's relevant to keep, that it is, relevant to keep, then we should make sure that the data model also uh, is recording it or is ensuring that that information is kept. Okay, seems like there are all the questions. So we're gonna move on to the second exercise. And in this case, we have, um, we're touching on the idea of reusing analysis results, right? Because this is one of the key things about having a data model is that all the information that you keep is uh, all the results information that you keep can be then reused. And you know the context that surrounds those results. So you know that you're actually reusing the results that you think uh, that, you, uh, that you are reusing and that you want to reuse. So in this case, I want you to think about the scenario. I want to think that you know you had a request to produce to perform this this analysis, the survival analysis, and you produced this Kaplan Meyer, and you written up your work, you finalized it, you completed the submission that you had to do, and then comes a request to publish basically the same analysis but in a different venue, and this venue has a set of recommendations, so the plot that you produced before it doesn't fit that venue recommendations. Right. So here you have a, a comment. Uh, please, can you modify modify your Kaplan Meier plot to meet the current recommendations of the journal as spelled out by Morris? Uh, and of course, to make this a realistic scenario, we have a deadline, which is tomorrow. Uh, it tends to be like that. So, like I said, this is a very common scenario. You, we, we want to use uh, the same analysis results, but in a variety of venues because each venue might have, like we, in this specific case, different requirements. Uh, we might need to tailor our outputs uh, or plot tables to fit the, the audience. So it means that we have to um, be able to reformat um, these, these outputs to meet the specifications that are required. So if you go then to um, Morris, at all, if you check this, we see that there is a paper that um, uh, this group of people did, and in in this this paper they run the survey and asked people what do they think a Kaplan Meier plot should have, um, and they kind of summarized it into basically it should have the this table below the plot. Uh, with um, the numbers at risk censored in uh, the subject that experienced an event. It should also have the confidence bands around the the curve, the, the Kaplan Meier curves, the estimates. So I have a question or a couple of questions for you. Again, in the Slido poll, uh, the poll tab of Slido. Um, so my questions are, Given the analysis results data model that we start building in the first exercise, can we fulfill this request without making a new analysis? And second, is there any information that we are missing and that we did not capture in our data model? Okay, and if we then go to the second, is there any information missing that we didn't capture? So a lot of people are saying that, yes, there is information that is missing that we did not capture, but we can calculate that. Okay. So if I go then to the second exercise, let's resume again. 
And thank you for participating in the poll. This is very, very helpful to hear your opinions and to, to hear your thoughts. So again, it's the beginning like we saw before. Um, one caveat that I want to put here is that typically what uh, would happen is that assuming we did not have anything like a data model, assuming that we did not even have this mindset of thinking of analysis results as data, a typical thing that would happen is a person would have to redo the analysis, right? And when you go to the point where you try to I mentioned this briefly before, when you go to, to a point where you try to re or rewrite an analysis that somebody did and you don't have sufficient information or you, you think you have sufficient information to uh, rewrite that, it, it's not uncommon that you end up introducing some errors. So what we have here is a typical scenario where you would rerun your analysis. It might be that the person re uh, rerunning or reproducing, sorry, recreating that analysis would decide to use a specific setting to calculate, to, to estimate the confidence intervals. And that setting might deviate from what was actually uh, done in the analysis that produced um, that original product, that original plot. So this might be, not, this might not be, um, let's say uh, an error that was introduced uh, because of, of an accident. This might be a, a, an error that is introduced because of a, a different way of viewing how the analysis should be done. So again, having something like the analysis results data model, having a way of, uh, or just thinking about results as data would allow us to have results that we can reuse and we can bypass trying to reproduce, recreate analysis that were done uh, even when we don't have sufficient information. Um, so about the question of if we have enough information uh, or if we're missing any information um, in our, um, that we capture according to our data model, we, we have all the information that we required. The only thing we don't have is the uh, cumulative sums that would go to the table that's below the plot. But this, like a lot of you said, is not too problematic because we can calculate the missing information. And so here I'm just loading again the survival ARD that we had. I'm seeing that we have basically all the information we need. Um, here I'm again applying the same code that we did before. I didn't, didn't write anything new. I'm just applying the same code, producing the same plot, and then using that plot as a basis, uh, and then starting to add the confidence spans. So again, same thing, just confidence spans are added. There's nothing new really to it besides the, the, the addition of the band. And then to add the table below the plot is like, like we mentioned before, we need to calculate the cumulative sum for uh, the number of events and the sensory. Um, this is not too problematic because it's something that we can derive from the results that we have. So it's not necessarily a new analysis. It just, uh, just derives from the results that we already have. And um, in this case, I just created a series of functions that I'm using to calculate then the sums and then a function that uh, we can use to uh, add the table below the plot. And again, assuming that if, if you'd have this data model in production, let's say, uh, even though it's a very, very basic thing, you could then have all of these uh, functions um, ready to be used when needed because the data is always structured in the same way. So we know exactly what you should expect. So, so these functions can be standard functions that you just apply to your uh, to the data that's stored in the data model, according to the data model. So in this case, this is just the functions, and then um, we would then have the final plot. 
which would then follow the recommendations that are uh, part of uh, Morris at all. And there's a bit of a curveball here. We received an update to our request. So let's say that uh, the same person came back and apparently they don't really care much about the recommendations anymore. They prefer to have the sensor information in the lines uh, and the estimate of the survival curves and, and not in the table. But that's not much of a problem, right? Because again, we don't have to reproduce any analysis. We just go back to the results. We even have um, standardized code that produces that plot. And we can just remove that line from the table and add the uh, the lines, the, the censoring uh, to the estimates, to the survival curves. So again, and the 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 more amazing thing, more amazing part here is that we didn't have to redo. We made two different plots, and we didn't have to redo uh, any analysis. This is all. All of this came from the information that we stored in this very simplified um, um, analysis results data model. So, I have then one after question about this exercise. Sorry, I went a bit too far. And there's a poll appearing then on Slido. So what do you think that would facilitate these tasks that we shown here in exercise two, like adding the table below the pot, assuming that you have already a data model in place? What in your opinion, think? what do you think could facilitate this? Is there anything that we could, could have included in the data model to facilitate this, or even something that's external to the data model, but can be used in collaboration with it. Let's say take home questions. So these are more open questions that um, you can explore later. And it probably would require a bit more time to think about them as well. So what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna skip, uh, no, not a break, but let's skip then to the closing part of the, the workshop. So I would say that there's a couple of uh, takeaway messages from today. One of them by far is to really ingrain this idea of shifting the target of um, data analysis to become, to, to shift it away from this, these data products and ensure that the target is actually having a reusable and accessible data source that you can um, create by by uh, first defining your data model and making sure that this, this follows your data model, your analysis results data model. And then the, the other key message here is that, again, you saw that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of things that are open. There's a lot of questions that are open and it's it's not so clear what is the best way of, of storing certain pieces of information or even what information should be stored. So it's key to understand that the way for this to evolve is to really hear everybody else and see if there is a way of finding a, a consensus. Um, so with this in mind, I have one last question for you. Again, in the Slido poll, from your experience, from what you what you um, also listened to today, what you did today in the exercises, what do you think, or what, what are the key points that a person should follow uh, when building an analysis results data model? Like key, key steps, like if somebody would stop you in the hallway tomorrow and ask, what, how do I start building my analysis results in the model? What do I have to keep in mind? Which step should I take? What would you say to them? The open question, so I just need a few minutes for people to respond. Okay, that we can spend less time formatting outputs and more time on the ARD. That's, that's true. 
that's a good point. Reproducibility, that anyone with an ARDM should be able to take and recreate. What information is required to reproduce the result? I think that's that's a very good uh, that's a very good um, uh, key point because I think that it tends to help when you look at what you're trying to achieve first, and then you kind of backtrack like what we did on the first exercise. For example, we looked at this at this thing that we wanted to reproduce this plot, and then we backtracked. We thought, okay, what what results are actually represented here? What contextual information do I need to keep? And we start building the data model like that. A few more answers are store carefully all the metadata and documentation. Ensure reproducibility, capture decisions, and think about extensibility to future outputs. That's that's also a very good point to make sure that when you when you're creating a data model, and this is a tricky thing to do this, right? It requires normally a lot of um, iterations over it. Is that it it should be flexible enough that um, you can include new analysis and include more information that is captured if you need to reformat then the data model. Determine critical aspects of data, store using a defined data type to avoid data loss, loss like tuples versus lists, I said it, that's a very good point. And provide results along with the data product for interpretability of humans and machines. Yes, definitely. Think about future analysis to ensure correct metadata. And you would say that there's a steep learning curve, but then the advantages will come as this becomes more stable. Yes, these are all very, very, very good points. Thank you. Thank you for sharing them with us. So with this in mind, we have five minutes more or less. Just to wrap up, I want to talk to you about just some, some again, we are missing a lot of people here for sure. And I want you to tell us who those people are. So we saw that there are already some companies, um, CDISC, for example, um, is also part of this, but and, and that are developing pieces of software are already taking into account these principles that we mentioned before. So they are they're already thinking about already analysis of results as data itself, or they are already thinking about which information do we need to capture to reproduce things, what information do we need to capture to make them reusable. So these are here are very few examples. Again, we're for sure missing people. So um, tell us if we are missing. And I want to highlight one last thing here, um, which is the, the OMOP common data model. This is something that we looked at at the very beginning when we were, um, again, writing this paper and, and searching around the area. This is a very good example of what can be achieved if you have a data model. Um, that um, is used by the community, by community. So the OMOP common data model was, uh, is a data model made to uh, make sure that there's standards around how observational data is stored and that they're able to easily reuse um, the results and also make sure that everything is reproducible. So they are like the key uh, I would say the key example of what what we can have if if you're able to uh, have consensus of what an analysis data model will look like. So with this, um, I would say that you know if if you are interested in this topic, if you have ideas on how to progress. Uh, and if you're working on similar problems, do reach out to us. We're quite interested and in see if we can continue to uh, build a community around this, building even a community of practice, uh, and see if you can also shape uh, how, um, how we will use the analysis results data model in the future.
So thank you very much for your participation. Um, thank you very much for um, being so active in the polls. I don't know if there's any questions left over in the chat, but I'm happy to answer them before we fully finish today. I okay, don't see any questions. Okay, yes, Lucas put a link there to our website. We plan on keeping it a bit more also up to date and we will link everything there. I think the paper is already linked on that website. Um, we'll also make sure the um, uh, public repository with all the materials that you saw here today on the public cloud, cloud are also link there, is also linked there. Um, and yeah, thank you much for, again, for participating and I hope you found this interesting. <laughs>